I hereby call the Wednesday, February 15th, 2017, Planning Commission meeting to order. Mr. Trivet, will you call the roll? Here. Edwards? Here. Lee? Here. Loracus? Stafford? Here. Macbeth? Here. Julian? Here. All right, the first item on our agenda is approval of minutes. We have the January 18th regular meeting. Let's take that one first. Does anybody have any additions or amendments to the January 18th minutes? No, oh, ma'am. Hearing none, move to approve the minutes as presented. Second that motion. Will you call the roll? Sure. Schaller? Aye. Edwards? Aye. Lee? Aye. Stafford? Aye. Macbeth? Aye. Julian? Aye. And then we have the minutes for the January 2015 2017 work session. Does anybody have any edits or amendments to those minutes? Hearing none. I motion that we approve the minutes from the January 25th 2017 work session. Second. Will you call the roll? Dollar? Aye. Edwards? Aye. Lee? Aye. Stafford? Abstain. Macbeth? Aye. Julian? Abstain. We have no items on the consent agenda, so we'll move to the public hearings. We've got four public hearings today, and they deal with two separate matters, so we're going to take them in pairs. The first set of public hearings is PCR 17-001 and PCR 17-002, request of the William Mary Real Estate Foundation to amend the zoning ordinance, as well as for a special use permit for a student dormitory. At this point, I will recuse myself from the matter being an employee of the College of William and Mary. As will I as well. And I will as well. And I will pass the um, <laughs> running of the meeting over to Mr. Klee, who has seniority from the remaining members. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, because the, the first two items are um, related, we're going to take them together. So this is PCR 17-001. Request of the William and Mary Real Estate Foundation to amend the zoning ordinance to define student dormitory, to allow a student dormitory with a special use permit, and to amend the lot area density requirements in the LB2 uh, district. PCR 17-002 is the request of the William and, Mar William and Mary Real Estate Foundation for a special use permit for a student dormitory at 902 Richmond Road, which is in the LB2 uh, neighborhood limited business neighborhood district. Uh, so to start us off, Ms. Murphy, would you present the staff report? Yes, sir. Mr. Clee and members of the Planning Commission. The Wayme Mary Real Estate Foundation is proposing to purchase and convert the Days Inn at 902 Richmond Road from a hotel to a student dormitory. The Days Inn property contains 102 guest rooms with 102 parking spaces. The applicant is proposing to lease the property to the College of Wayme Mary for use as an undergraduate non-freshman residence hall with a capacity not to exceed 180 students. A copy of the applicant's statement was included in your packet. The applicant proposes to amend the following sections of the zoning ordinance. Section 21-2, definitions to define a student dormitory. Section 21255-4 to allow a student dormitory in the LB2 district with a special use permit. And section 21-255.5 to allow the maximum number of rooms permitted to be determined as part of the special use permit process. The college notes in their application that due to the age and variety of on-campus housing, a significant renovation program will be underway that will impact housing availability in the future. The immediate reason for the purchase of the Days Inn stems from the planned renovation of Landrum Hall, which houses 225 students during the next academic year, followed by the Green and Gold Village and the Body Talk Complex, among others. They are sensitive to both the potential impact on displaced students and the surrounding neighborhoods if an additional 225 students are not housed on campus and thus relocated into surrounding areas off campus. The property will be operated by the college's Office of Residence Life, and residents will be subject to the college rules and procedures. They propose to staff the facility with one head resident and five resident assistants whose responsibilities and hours are noted in my memo. The applicant proposes a specific police officer being assigned to the property who will work directly with the residents and with student affairs staff to keep the students safe, prevent problems, and hold anyone accountable that engages in inappropriate or illegal behavior on site. 
Patrol units will routinely patrol the area on a continuous basis, respond to issues immediately, and assist with addressing concerns, and be available to talk with community members. A 24-hour-a-day phone number has been provided for anyone who is with issues to report directly to the William & Mary Police Communication Center. Students with vehicle, vehicles residing at the Days Inn will have the ability to purchase general residential parking decals from the college and will have access to the controlled parking spaces using their college identification. Site improvements are noted in my memo and include removing the swimming pool, update lighting, fencing, upgrade electrical systems, fire protection, fire alarm, and detection systems to meet ADA requirements and repairs to buildings and properties. And this is the overall site plan submitted. The Architectural Review Board reviewed the, last, the application last night and conceptually approved the stair towers, canopy, trash enclosures, revised fencing, and gate enclosures. These are photos that were submitted and conceptually approved for a fence design. And as you can see, it's been modified somewhat from what was in the original application. They are proposing pillars, brick pillars with fencing, not only across the front but down the sides, and with the gate enclosures further back as shown previously. The city's comprehensive plan is a policy document that is designed to guide the physical and economic development of Williamsburg by offering a distinctive vision for both its natural and built environment. For zoning changes and special use permit, this document provides goals, objectives, and policies in evaluating applications. I have included in my memo the comprehensive plan sections for Chapter 7, Land Use, Chapter 8, Neighborhoods and Housing, Chapter 9, Institutions, and Chapter 10, Commercial and Economic Development. You were also provided in your packet emails from residents and the Montessori School on this request. As stated previously, this site currently contains 102 guest rooms and 102 parking spaces. The proposal is to convert the motel rooms into student dormitory rooms for use as undergraduate, non-freshman residence hall with a capacity not to exceed 180 students. The college is implementing a significant renovation program that will take residence halls off-site and offline for an academic year and two summers to update their dormitories. This will require additional housing stock to mitigate the loss of beds due to the proposed renovations. Their immediate need, as stated in their application, is driven by the planned renovation of Landrum Hall scheduled to occur during the next academic year. <clears throat> the college requires all freshmen to live on campus, with 225 beds being removed from inventory and up to 180 beds being added if the application is approved, a deficit of 45 beds would need to be absorbed either on or off campus. If the days in proposal is not approved, the applicant has stated in their application they do not have the capacity to absorb these students on campus. Therefore, these students will need to find off-campus housing, which equates to approximately 60 additional dwelling units being required off-campus. This will require students to find available housing units in single-family dwellings in existing neighborhoods, apartment complexes, condominiums, or townhomes in and outside the city. I included enrollment projections for the next year in the selection process for students to request on-campus housing in my memo. <clears throat> Staff has a concern is that after 10 p.m. Monday through Friday and 11 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday, the HRs and RAs monitor the site from their rooms. The close proximity of the site to neighborhoods requires additional monitoring of the site to mitigate noise and safety of students residing on the property. When evaluating the request, one must take into account the impact on adjacent neighborhoods to the Days End property and the impacts to the city as a whole. These neighbor these, those neighborhoods adjacent to the site will see an increase in the number of students walking, biking, and driving to campus. An increase in noise and trash will be associated with an additional 180 students in this quarter. However, conditions can be placed on the property to help mitigate these concerns. Impact on the city as a whole with approving the request would be that up to 60 dwelling units throughout the city may not be converted to student rentals. The impact of dwelling units being converted to student rentals in neighborhoods in close proximity to campus will increase noise, trash, and affect property values in these neighborhoods. 
The city needs to ensure that land use decisions are made that are fiscally balanced from a revenue standpoint and the removal of commercial property to a residential use is mitigated. The loss of revenue associated with the conversion of this property from a revenue producing property to a non-taxable property ranges from approximately $60,000 to $90,000 a year. The revenue loss does not take into account the full revenue if the property were to be redeveloped into another commercial use. The loss of commercial use for the property can be mitigated by placing a time limit on the property to allow for the renovation of the existing dormitories on campus. With a time limit, the college and city can work together to find other opportunities to construct modern housing in the Midtown planning area, thereby allowing the redevelopment of this property into a mixed-use property. The comp plan notes that the Midtown planning area is 3% owner-occupied and 97% renter-occupied. The minor rentals in this area, the number of students who live in this area who currently walk along Richmond Road from Midtown to campus or ride or drive to campus, and the comps plan recommendation to allow additional students in this area, area supports the request to allow up to 180 students at 902 Richmond Road. I'm sorry. The comprehensive plan notes that the Midtown planning area is 3% owner-occupied and 97% renter-occupied. The comprehensive plan recommends the Midtown planning area as a location for new student housing. It also states that locating student housing in this area has the potential to free up affordable housing in existing neighborhoods. The proposed dormitories located on the edge of the Midtown planning area, as noted in this slide, and would have the potential to prevent additional houses in city neighborhoods from being converted to student rentals. When evaluating the impact on the city as a whole, housing 180 students in one location under the supervision and regulations of the college is preferred to 180 students living in other neighborhoods in the city. If the college cannot house 180 students in college housing, this will result in additional housing units that may be absorbed in neighborhoods and other areas in the city. Until new housing stock is built in the city, the temporary solution to house 180 students as proposed by the applicant at 902 Richmond Road is acceptable if impacts such as noise and aesthetics are mitigated. This proposal is, sort of, is supported by the policies and recommendations set forth in 2013 comprehensive plan as noted in my memo. In addition, staff supports the application for the following reason. The use of the property as a student dormitory may prevent the location of additional students in surrounding neighborhoods within the city. Staff is recommending conditions that address a, a five-year time limit for the proposal to mitigate the potential revenue loss from the conversion. A time limit, five-year time limit, limit allows the city to evaluate if the college is continuing to renovate dormitories as stated in their application and to mitigate any other negative effects on the city from the conversion of the hotel to a student dormitory. It also allows for the college to renovate the outdated dormitories and provide an opportunity for this property and the adjacent city property to be combined and redeveloped in the future. Staff is proposing a condition that the public safety on site and the aesthetics of the structure by requiring that the proposed gate enclosure, the proposed fencing and and provide landscaping on the perimeter. The proposal to construct a solid wooden fence with a metal gate across the front has been changed based on the Architectural Review Board's approval last evening, so staff is not making recommending that that be a condition. Staff is recommending an on-site security guard to address safety and noise concerns. This allows for trained individuals to address safety concerns and neighborhood concerns associated with the property due to its close proximity to neighborhoods. The college is willing to partner with the city to install a bus stop in close proximity to the Days Inn to mitigate pe pedestrian traffic between this property and campus. The city and college needs to work together in this initiative to help mitigate foot and vehicle tra traffic in this corridor. Staff is recommending that the college provide bike racks at this location and lastly, staff is recommending that the college adequately address parking for the project in advance prior to re receiving permits for the renovations on the building. Therefore, staff supports the application based on the above consistency reviewed 
with existing policy and the 2013 comprehensive plan and recommends that planning commission recommend the city council that re the request to add student dormitory to allow a student dormitory with a special use permit and to amend the light area density requirements in the LB2 district proposed in ordinance 17-02 be approved with the conditions noted in my memo with the removal of condition two since a revision to the fencing and gate enclosure was conceptually approved by Architectural Review Board at their meeting last night and is acceptable to staff. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Vernon Getty, the applicant's attorney, and other representatives of the college are also present <clears throat> and will provide additional information during the public hearing. Do any commission members have any questions for Ms. Murphy before we go any further? Yeah, I do. Uh, what, what's the current, do we know what the current maximum capacity is at the hotel as it sits? It's 102 guest rooms, so, and it's 102 rooms. I guess you can have two individuals per, per room. I think they're double beds, but the applicant may nor, know more about that than so I it's do. It's basically 200 now. So if you have two to, per room. Right. And clarify for me, if you could, the, the purpose of the, the five-year approval. Staff looked at the five-year approval as a way to mitigate the noise and safety concerns raised by not only the applicants but the neighborhood and also to look at if the college, as I mentioned in my memo, is continuing to uh, renovate their dorms and to, uh, to help us look at the overall goal of what we want in the Richmond Road Midtown planning area. Because I think the goal for everyone is to have both not only this site, but the old Tioga site next door, which is owned by the city, to be redeveloped into uh, new mixed use uses. So, so if, if at the, the end of the five year period, they were to be denied a second special use permit, what happens with the property at that point? Does it sit empty or does it, do they have to sell the property? What do we do with the property at that point? Well, I think that's probably a question the college may want to add, uh, answer. Uh, the, if the special use permit is not renewed at the end of five years, then they would have to meet whatever, put up use in there that meets the LB2 zoning district requirements. Vernon, can Mr. Getty, can he answer what the plan may be if the end of five years another approval wasn't granted? We'll have an opportunity to ask questions right. of the applicant. Right. Um, I did have one question, which is uh, if there is a special use permit granted, does that convey with uh, the property? In other words, if the property is sold to another entity, does that special use permit convey or is that, um, is that only for? The special use permit runs with the property, but as you can see, there are a bunch of conditions on the use of the building and demolition of the building. The special use permit would go away as staff's Thank recommendation, but it does run with the property. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Great. Thank you. Uh, with that, um, we can open the public hearing. Um, I think first yeah, we have a representative from the applicant uh, to speak to this project. Mr. Acting Chairman, <laughs> members of the commission, uh, I'm Vernon Getty. It's my pleasure to be here representing the William & Mary Real Estate Foundation. Uh, you probably know the foundation is a private, not-for-profit entity that exists for the benefit of the college, and uh, its mission includes buying, developing, leasing real estate uh, for specific college needs, in this case for student housing. Uh, you may be familiar with the foundation. It is the entity that developed the Tribe Square project further in on uh, Richmond Road in close partnership with the city. Uh, a number of representatives of the foundation and college are here. Nancy Buchanan, executive director of the foundation, and Sam Jones, who's the vice president of administration and finance for the college, among others, are here. Um, you know William and Mary, it's a state-owned public residential university, part of the state's higher education system. Um, the college has long been committed to providing housing for 75% of its undergraduate student population. In that regard is unique in the state of Virginia. Um, no other public university, I think, comes close to that. 
Um, to do that, it has a number of residence halls on campus of varying ages and varying conditions. Uh, the need for this project is driven by the college's need to undertake a significant renovation program of its residence halls. While that is underway, individual dorms are taken offline at the end of an academic year. Yeah. Okay. At the end of an academic year, um, that's they're out of commission for a summer or a full academic year in the following summer. Um, as Carolyn stated, the immediate need here is driven by the need to renovate Landrum Hall this coming year. Um, as she said, that houses 225 students, and there is a critical need to update that facility. Uh, that renovation project will displace 225 students, and the college, for a number of reasons, does not want to force those students all into non-college housing in the surrounding neighborhoods in the city and elsewhere. Um, both the impact that would cause on those neighborhoods and frankly for the impact it would cause on the college's housing uh, program and its budget. Um, following the Landrum renovations, their planned renovations for the Green and Gold Village complex and following that the Botetot complex. Both of those are multi-building complex and would be multi-year renovation projects. So we're looking out probably eight to ten years just with those projects um, that are on the books right now. Um, we would submit the ability to house up to 180 students at the Days Inn property would significantly mit mitigate the impact the renovation program could have on the community. Um, as described in detail in our submission and in the staff report, uh, the college expects Days Inn would house a mix of primarily sophomores and juniors um, in this facility. Um, it would be a college-operated residence hall. Students there would be subject to all college regulations in the student handbook. Um, the code of student conduct um, would apply there. The facility would be staffed with a head residence and five RAs, um, which is a somewhat higher ratio of RAs to students than you would typically find on campus. And those RAs would be located throughout the facility, both on first and second floor and rooms facing in and out. Um, those RAs are trained to confront and document violations of the rules and regulations. Um, and any conduct that does not meet university standards. Um, an RA would be on site and on duty from 6.30 in the evening until 7.30 the next morning. Um, as part of that time, they would be in a central office and part in their room, but part of their duties are also making rounds um, while they are on duty. Um, another part of their duties are having hall meetings, providing information to students, including reviewing the applicable rules and regulations of the college um, and of the city of Williamsburg, including the noise ordinance and rules and laws governing drinking and drug use. Um, the college also has a series of very helpful uh, tips and hints on being good neighbors, which are reviewed with students at the beginning of each year. Um, as a college-operated facility, the William Mary Police Department will have jurisdiction over this property. Um, William and Mary police have the same training and police authority as any police force in Virginia, including the power of arrest. Uh, the department will routinely patrol the facility and will also assign a specific officer to the facility, and that officer will work directly with residents of the facility and the student affairs staff there um, to keep students safe, to address and prevent problems and address and hold accountable anyone who does cause issue in violating rules and regulations. That officer will also serve as a community liaison to hear and process community concerns. 
the chief of police will also be actively involved in that. And, and as Caroline said, in our submission material has already put out a phone number to call with any concerns that will put you to the William & Mary Police Communications Center. I review this detail because I think it demonstrates the significant degree of control that will be present in this college-operated oper housing facility as opposed to students living on their own out in student rentals in the neighborhoods. Um, another advantage, again, Weem and Mary has a full range of discipline at its disposal. Um, we, uh, city police, if called, have a choice of either arresting somebody or not. The college has its full graduated disciplinary process and procedures, and you have William and Mary police who, if necessary, can arrest someone but could also refer back into the college disciplinary system. Uh, so again, we think that provides a great deal of control over what happens at the facility. Um, you've seen the parking information, I think, that was distributed earlier today in response to Carolyn's request. Based on the experience with student parking program at the college, the college projects 100 students living here would have cars. Uh, part of that is based on the fact that sophomores, except in extraordinary circumstances, aren't allowed to have cars at all. So you saw in the projections of 60 sophomores lived here, you'll have three cars. 80% um, of upperclassmen have cars so that if there are 120 more, you'd have a total of 100 cars at this facility. And while it now has 100 parking spaces with some of the site changes that uh, have taken place um, and were reviewed last night, um, you'll probably end up with 75 to 80 parking spaces on site. So there will be 20, potentially 20 cars that would need to park in other college facilities and Kaplan Arena lot, which is two blocks away, has 622 spaces. The School of Education has 240 spaces, you know, both within easy walking distance. We agree with Carolyn's analysis that this proposal is substantially in accordance with the city's comprehensive plan. Uh, one of the central themes running through the city's plans for many years has been the protection and preservation of single-family detached residential neighborhoods by limiting the number of student rentals in those neighborhoods. And we would submit this proposal helps accomplish that goal. Um, it also helps um, the goal in that it takes 102 outdated motel type hotel rooms off the market uh, the city itself has been aggressively doing lately. We also recognize that this is not a perfect solution uh, for anybody. Uh, it's not a perfect ap application. Uh, unfortunately, there is no such thing. Um, the college is sensitive to concerns from the neighbors held a neighborhood meeting at Boy Hall, have had a number of individual meetings with neighbors. We've read all the correspondence. We, we understand their concerns, and the college will do all it reasonably can to ensure this facility and its residents are good neighbors and do not cause the problems that are feared. I think the fundamental question here, though, is, is the city as a whole better off with these 180 students housed in this facility under supervision and control of the college or with these students pushed out into the neighborhoods, as Carolyn notes, with a potential of 60 additional rental units. Heard many of the concerns expressed particularly by residents of Matoka Court. And it strikes us that what have been the issues there is exactly what housing students in this facility would help prevent. Carolyn has proposed several conditions in her recommendation, and I would like to briefly comment on them. Um, certainly agree with conditions five, six, and sevens. Get the easy ones out of the way first. I think conditions two and three are addressed by the uh, plans that were reviewed and unanimously approved last night at the ARB relating to the gate design and fence design. 
I think they've come up with a very good solution there. Um, I would like to address conditions one and four. Uh, we don't believe condition four is necessary, and that's one of the reasons I went into the detail I did about the... Yeah, four is the one requiring a guard site. Yeah, I'll we could just hold the, the uh, questions until we've had everybody a chance to speak. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss many of these things, but the yeah. point of clarification I think is useful. So condition one is that, that this is valid for five years, and condition four is the security guard, right? right? And those are the two that you'd like to address? Right, exactly. Thank you. And, and four, we simply don't think that requirement is necessary given the degree of control that will be there with the staffing I've described and the role of the William and Mary police. And, and frankly, it would be prohibitively expensive to have an additional William & Mary police officer there 24 hours a day. That's four full-time equivalent positions that um, we simply don't think are necessary and frankly aren't in anybody's budget. Um, with respect to Condition 1, that's uh, to us the more, more critical and most critical um, condition. Five-year sunset provision on this permit would essentially make this project unfinanceable. No lender will lend money um, knowing that in five years it's possible the use on which they're lending has to stop. Um, it, it, that simply doesn't work in a killer um, for the project. Um, and I will point out, as a practical matter, even with the renovations that would be done as a part of this project, this building has a finite, useful life. There's going to be a point in the not-too-distant future that there will be another plan, which under Condition 5, requiring any changes to come back to the city, the city will have an opportunity to review a new plan and use for this property. Condition one, as written, would be extremely problematic. Um, with that, we would respectfully ask that you forward these applications to City Council um, with a recommendation of approval, but without conditions one and four. Uh, and with that, i uh, be happy to answer any questions we can. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Getty. So I think we can have some questions now. We might have some additional questions after we've had the public hearing. but but. Does anybody, uh, would any commissioners like to ask any questions now? Sure, I'd like to. Um, I would, as a business person, I would agree with you in that a five-year permit is going to make the project extremely difficult uh, for a number of reasons, financing being the biggest. And I, I can see why a, a bank or a finance source doesn't want to loan money on something that you don't know if it's going to be there in five years. However, on the other side of the coin, as a planning commissioner, if this does go forward on a five-year term, my question then is, if for some reason it does not get renewed at the end of five years, is there a plan in place for the property? What happens with the property at that point? There, there is no such plan right now. Continuing on that, or uh, should the project, this project, fail to be recommended by Planning Commission and fail to be approved by the City Council, what's your alternative? Um, well, I guess there are a couple alternatives, um, one of which is delaying things further. Um, very difficult given the critical need to renovate Landrum Hall. There is always an alternative of the college doing this project. We wouldn't be here if that's what they wanted to do. The foundation, for many reasons, they would like to do the project through the foundation in partnership with the city. But the college could do the project. Uh, I only had one question, which was, uh, I wonder if you could tell us something about the status of the Dillard project and whether that, or the Dillard complex, and whether that um, might play a role in solving this problem that you've identified. Yeah, that one I'm going to refer to Sam Jones. Okay. Thank you. Chairman, 
chance to speak. Could you use the microphone just so we can get it in the audio? Thank you. Sam Sorry, Jones you. from uh, William and Mary. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to speak for the time you're spending here and for the staff recommendation that we have. Uh, in terms of the Dillard complex, long-term plans for that in our master plan is that you would uh, we're turning that more and more into an athletics complex. The two facilities there, you know, one of which I came in in, in 1971 and stayed in as a freshman, uh, they're, you know, they're quite substantial, but they have many problems. So, they're, they're, you know, the idea of going in and doing any type of rehab of those facilities is not something we, we would plan on doing. Eventually, with no time frame, some of it donor-driven as to whether we get support for athletic activities, the idea would be at some point those facilities would be demolished. And, again, we would, we would have some other athletic activity out there. But in the short term, they're not, they're not being used. And the they're, they're not they're being, being used other than for some storage. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Getty, the, the city recommends it a five-year special use permit, and obviously you've asked that there be no, no term set on it. Uh, is there a more palatable number for the school in there, or is it? Well, I, I could only say if there must be one, the longer the better. Obviously, we would rather not have one at all. Just to follow on that, I just want to make sure I understood. You were saying that this is an eight to ten year project, do you think? Or is that eight to ten years beyond the five years? In other words, all the renovate, let, let's imagine or fast forward to a time when all the renovations have been completed, yeah. uh, for this generation anyway, and um, any new facilities have been built, and there's no longer a need for this uh, overflow housing, I guess we'll call it. What is the, when does that happen? Is that the eight to 10 year? Yeah, the, the three projects I described are the right. eight to 10 years. Okay, thank you. Landrum, Green and Gold Village, and Botetot. Great. Um, whether at that point there would be a need to start somewhere else, I don't know at this point. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Thank you very much, thank Mr. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we can open the floor up. We have, we have four yellow cards. Uh, I see maybe a couple of others out in the, the audience, and uh, I suspect there may be a few others that didn't quite get to put a card in. So what I'll do is uh, have the people that got their cards in first, we'll hear from them, and then if there are others who want to, to speak, we'll open up the floor. Um, we just ask that you give your name, and um, we just give your name uh, before you speak. Uh, name and address, thank you. So we'll begin with the first of these, which is uh, Joe Hertzler at 605 College Terrace. Mr. Hertzler. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, Joe Hertzler, live at 605 College Terrace, um, neighborhood near the project. And um, I've been in your shoes, uh, served eight <laughs> years on Planning Commission, and I know you've got a tough decision ahead of you here, but I really hope that we can get to a win-win on this thing. I see a ton of opportunities for win-lose and lose-lose, but I hope we can work through this to find a win-win. Um, you're going to hear quite a few comments. You've gotten a lot of emails about the negative part of if this goes through. And I share a lot of those concerns. I really do. Um, this could potentially have a detrimental effect on the neighborhoods. There's no question about that. But I wanted to talk a little bit about maybe some of the positive things that could come out of this if you decide to go through with it. Again, what I'm after here is a win-win. Because I'm convinced that the college needs the community, the community needs the college. We've got a world-class institution right here in our own backyard and the college is a, is a vibrant, thriving part of our economy. Uh, they need a vibrant, thriving community. We need a vibrant, thriving college. Let's put our efforts together and work together and not try to bash each other. And, and let's get this thing done in a way that makes sense. So win-win, that's what I'm after. Um, I think staff has provided the context for that win-win, and specifically the special use permit with the sunset clause. 
Um, that's, I think, with that in the, that, that language in there, it, it gives the community, it keeps the community and the college involved with each other. Um, I think from the community standpoint, it's, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, let's do it. But I would strongly like to recommend to all of you guys on the college to find a way to work through that. I know the, um, it, it complicates the, the, the finances on it, uh, but we've got some really good, smart guys in the room here. Uh, I know you can find a way to keep that sunset provision in there and let it, uh, let it do what it's, it needs to do, get the community involved in it, get the community on your side, and let's see this thing go forward. I see some real positives that could come out of this. For instance, last night, I'm on the Architectural Review Board, so we, we uh, reviewed the plans that, uh, that they came before us. Immediately, you're going to see an improved streetscape. Uh, it's going to look a whole lot better than it is right now. The, the people that are living in that facility are going to be less transient. It's a typical motel guest stays maybe a night, two nights. The students that are going to be there are there for the whole year. So they're committed to that area much in a much different way than a hotel guest ever would be. Um, the authority, the ability to hold these students accountable is much greater, and I want to emphasize that, much greater than any hotel operator has with the guests. These students are subject to the William & Mary Code of Conduct. The students take that very seriously, and they will do what they need to do. I believe that to be the case. Um, you're going to see increased spending by the students on the, in the, uh, up and down the corridor right there, going uh, up towards um, the, the shopping center. Um, an, another real benefit to this is that you're going to have a stable, uh, sound, long-term owner of this property that has a vested interest in the college and the community thriving much more than a, than a hotel owner would ever have. The, the college needs a vibrant neighborhood. Uh, when parents are bringing students in to, to consider William & Mary, sure, the main thing they look at is the college, the academics of the, of the college. But they also, any of you that have ever, ever gone through taking your kid around to look at schools knows you also look at the community. It plays a huge factor in deciding what school you're going to go to. So the college needs to support it, to be around it. I know they, they, they see that. And finally, uh, another benefit of this is, is it, it is going to decrease the pressure of students, student rentals in the neighborhoods. We know that to be the case. It's proven out in a number of municipalities around the country. It does make a difference in, in it. Again. I see a lot of negatives, okay? You're going to hear a lot of negatives about the project, and, and I won't discount those at all. There are a lot of concerns in it. But if we can put this thing together in a way that has that five-year provision, the college comes in and does what it says it's going to do, five years from now, and we're going through this again, I'll lead the charge saying the college did exactly what they said they would do, this is a good proposal, let's give them another five years. So I think there's ability to, to extend that over time if it's working. If it's not working, we can pull the plug at that time. But I would, I would encourage you to, to look forward, look to that win-win. I would really ask the college to try to find a way to keep that uh, sunset clause in there. And again, let's, let's work together as a community, as a college, let's solve this thing together. Thank you, Mr. Herzler. Uh, the next speaker we have uh, is Dr. Whitley at uh, 110 Governor Berkeley. Thank you. John Whitley, 110 Governor Berkeley Road. I'm here to speak favorably because I am appreciative of the reaching out to the city uh, exhibited by the university. For too long we have considered, and I've said this to you before when you were differently configured, that Richmond Road and Jamestown Road have often served to be the moat around the college, either preventing entry or exit. 
I celebrated loudly Tribe Square coming into existence because it said to one and all, there is the willingness to reach out and to support. I feel strongly that by moving forward with this proposal, that we will have a strong entity of presence of the university in that particular area. Three years ago, I approached the owner of the hotel about would he, what were his plans for the hotel, and thinking that it would be an ideal spot, since it's configured rather closely, if not therein, the arts district to become a center for the arts with some renovation to the facility. I think if we can do what we did to the facility on Capitol Landing to afford a, a distillery, it certainly looks as if there could be here something of note uh, for the arts. Who knows? Maybe the School of Architecture and the Arts. Uh, I think whatever possibilities that we can think outside the box and the configurations then that we let preclude our being creative, we, we need to do. Uh, I know that there are issues that of our concern to the neighbors. I also know that the city and the university have a system. The community relations, uh, I won't call it council, possibly it is, where the issues relative to uh, behavior and others that can be resolved quickly. But I also, also feel strongly that if in our deliberative actions prior to that prior to any incidents is that we collaboratively work hand in glove, community, city, community, and the university in making certain that there are preventive strategies so that the minimization of corrective strategies does, does not, uh, doesn't present itself as an issue. I feel strongly also that the, the presence of a, a, a police on the property it just feels a bit abrasive to me. I think RAs and their role are quite uh, responsive to that. Whatever you can do to facilitate the comfort and the ease of the university moving forward with this, I would almost beg you to do so because it, I think it's an opportunity to show who we are as a city and to show the hand-in-hand -hand linkage uh, the university with, with, the, with the town. Lastly, and a bit parochial on my behalf, if there is an entity, be it the university or whomever it might be, that has an interest in the old Howard Johnson's motel in front of Skipwith Farms, please step forward. <laughs> we welcome all creative economy expressions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next card is from Harmony Dalglish, if I've pronounced that correctly. Yeah. Dalglish, thank you. Uh, 214 Matoka Court. Harmony Dalglish at 214 Matoka Court. And I guess I get to start off the um, comments of opposition to this, um, to this proposal. Um, I have lived at Matoka Court for about five years now, and I see many of my neighbors um, in the audience here today. Um, I attended many of the uh, meetings at the, with the campus and with neighborhoods, and one phrase really stuck out to me as I continue to think about this idea and that was this idea of a thriving campus and vibrant neighborhoods. And you heard, heard Joe Hertzler talk about that. He, I think, is the person where I started hearing all those phrases from. But that really stuck in my head. And I'm opposed to this idea because I think it betrays both of those concepts. Um, from the campus perspective, I don't think this is a place where students are going to want to live. I actually looked at the map and I mapped out distances from most of the dorms on campus to key locations on campus. This site is two times further away from the dining hall than the average dorm on campus. It's two and a half times further from the SWEM library than the average dorm on campus. It's about two and a half times further to the Sadler Center. These students are going to need to walk a long way on streets that don't have sidewalks, that aren't necessarily well lit. I think this is a place where students aren't going to want to be. Uh, the lack of lighting in the sidewalks brings me to my second major concern, and that is student safety. As a 19-year-old girl, I would not have wanted to live in this dorm. 
I would have been concerned for my safety when only a single dorm w door was between my room and basically the outside. Fences and gates can be easily climbed over. Most dorms on campus, I believe all dorms on campuses, have security at the main door to the building. You have to swipe after hours to get in and you then have the security at your door. Um, so to me, that's a concern and I'd certainly as a 19-year-old college girl, I, I would have I would have not felt comfortable living in this dorm. So I, li I live on Matoka Court. I've lived there for about five years now, and it is a gem of a neighborhood. I love this neighborhood. I can walk to the grocery store. I can walk to the hardware store. I can walk to the swimming pool. It's a great gem of a place on, uh, in, in Williamsburg. Um, and I think putting a dorm practically on my street is going to destroy that. I think things like Partying, noise, random acts of vandalism, parking overflow. Right now, these are things that are a nuisance, right? And putting a dorm practically on my street is just going to exacerbate, and it's going to make those problems worse. It's at a tipping point that's going to push us over, and that's really what I'm concerned about. I think what we need is a long-term plan that's in everyone's best interests. Um, I heard the gentleman from the Real Estate Foundation say that this wasn't a perfect plan, there's no perfect solution, but we need a better solution, one that keeps the best interests of the college students and the neighborhoods in line together. And I think, I think we can do better. I think there's other options. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, our next card is from Wilson Skinner, who is at 41 Whitaker's Mill. That's all right. All are welcome. My property is uh, 108 and 110 Brook Street. It is located at ground zero, joining the back of the project property. After Landrum Hall and other dorms are renovated, college life will return to normal. If the William Mary plan does not work out, the College Terrace neighborhood will never be the same. For all the reasons that have been expressed, will be expressed in newspapers, emails, and by others, I believe that this is not the right project for this location. Thank you. Thank you. Our next card is from Henry Coleman at 606 College Terrace. Good afternoon, and thank you for giving me a few minutes to express my opinions for this particular project. I live at 606 College Terrace. I've lived there since 1980, and I've lived in Williamsburg since 1965. First of all, this plan requires that we uh, ignore our comprehensive plan, which was developed to try to have a reasonable control of what happens to the property within the confounds of the city of Williamsburg. The college at this moment is crying that they need help to house their students. Well, this is no surprise to any of us who've been here for a very long time. This has been an increasing problem. And uh, yes, we do wish to be accommodating. Many of us have fond memories of the College of William and Mary. However, the college has already purchased a major piece of commercial property in Williamsburg, and they are now using it as a dormitory. With the purchase of that property, it is not all in use. There is a quite sizable addition, which is, I do not believe, being used for student housing. Maybe that should be addressed. It has, uh, I believe, uh, could accommodate 100 students. Now, I do understand that there is a mole problem there. Well, all I can say is when you are making a purchase of that size, you should carefully look at it. I would hate to think 
that when I was purchasing a home, I would not check for such a common problem. And the college has had this problem in the buildings on campus, so they certainly have had experience with it, as they did in Blow Hall, in the registrar's area, where people were getting sick. Well, maybe they need to spend some money in making that part of the hospitality house hospitable. I do not think that is totally unreasonable. And with the purchase of that property, what did the college do for the city? I believe we lost a quite sizable amount of property tax. I believe we have lost those people staying there and their purchases in our businesses in Williamsburg. And the college lost a place for so many of its alumni who they wish us to come back, to come back to. So I think they uh, needed to be a little wiser in their movements of purchasing a property. As this particular site is now under consideration for revamping and the housing of our students, what is the impact that will have on the residential community adjacent to it? I do not believe anyone lives in a parallel universe to the extent that they think that this is going to make the adjacent areas a uh, more hospitable place for the family to move into. The city of Williamsburg has been for more than two decades working hard to try to protect the single family residents in the city and in particular to the properties close to the college. Now a large number of those houses which were 30 years ago, lived in by the owner and their families. Now, those have been lost. Once a property is lost to become a business property, which is what you have when you have a rental property, that is a business. It is very difficult to have that piece of property returned to a residential single family use. I have lived long enough on College Terrace to experience the problems that can create. Fortunately, two of those properties that were purchased and used as rental properties, and they did get very rough treatment, were purchased by people who saw them as a good place to live. And so they have quit being rentals. However, those houses which are now still being used as rentals do have slight problems of noise. But you understand that when you have students. We don't expect them to come here and, and just listen to John Denver all weekend. So that creates a problem for the city. It's hard for the city to enforce its own ordinances because those ordinances sometimes are not looked upon with favor by our court system, that is a problem. Parking, yes, they can create some more parkings at the motel, but what happens on those weekends when the college students have to move their cars out of the parking lots that they have paid to park in because there are athletic events going on? And therefore, if you don't get your car out of those, they will tow you away. That's not resolving those problems. The quality of life for the people who live on Matoka Court, for the people who would like to live on Nelson Avenue, and for the people who live on Harrison Avenue and College Terrace and Brook Street, this conversion is simply one more blow to that community. And it means one more loss of the piece of property 
that is paying a property tax to the city. And even though the people who stay in motels are transient, be that a surprise to anyone, uh, those people do go out and eat, they pay meal tax, they pay room tax. The conversion of this piece of property for a five-year, a ten-year, for a five-year, you might as well just say it is a permanent because people that are looking in property in those areas as a place to move their families will see that. The traffic on Richmond Road will not get less if all those students in that motel have a car. The students walking back and forth, they're perfectly fine. But wait until it's back and forth late in the evening and you've had your third beer at the Green Leaf it becomes less than wonderful or fine. With your children, aged zero to 17, before they go off to college, be enhanced from that experience? Will the children going into uh, the Montessori school be uh, improved by what they might see? Only a few students, I'll admit it. But that's enough not to be very pleasant. This is a short-term plan for a long-term problem. And if the college would really want it to be a good neighbor, they would find solutions that would not be detrimental in property tax, room tax, food tax, the tourist trade to which Colonial Williamsburg is trying to hang on to so desperately. There are, there are other solutions. Talk to Colonial Williamsburg. Maybe they would be willing to let the college rent governors in. Believe it or not, they've done it before. And they would then leave this property, which, if we could ever get things moving, could be redeveloped as a first class motel combining the property on the corner of Matoka Court and Richmond Road, which the city already owns, there is a chance to encourage a first-class motel to come in, which then would be close enough for alumni to stay in, which would be close enough for the visiting firemen that come to the college in a constant stream somewhere to stay. And it would be a good deed to do for Colonial Williamsburg, who would love to have a steady stream of money coming in from the governor's inn. Yes, I think this is a very unfortunate idea. I think it will not solve problems, but it is going to create more problems for the people who live in this area. And I say that as an alumna of the College of William and Mary. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have, I think, one more card, uh, which is Ruth Kaiser, 609 Richmond Road. <laughs> That's all right, I'll just. Hello? I live at 609 Richmond Road, so I guess I'm ground zero also. Who said? I just found out I'm also one of the 3%, which is really disappointing. Um, my husband bought the house at, on Richmond Road in 1980. It was the only house on the market, and he grabbed it. I had a huge chain link fence around the backyard. Um, it, it apparently had uh, rental rooms and a staircase going up the back. And um, we've done a lot of restoration on the property. I'm pretty proud of my house. We've been there long enough to see the neighborhoods start to bloom. There have been a lot of property improvements. Um, more bed and breakfasts, I think, than, than single families living there, but at least we were pleased that somebody was going to be invested in the structure, in the property, and that it was going to be an attractive neighborhood. And we would watch the houses swing. You know, one would come up for sale or wait, vacate, and we'd sit there with our fingers crossed, hoping that it wasn't going to be a rental. And so uh, the last house to fall is actually, is there anybody here from Nelson? Okay, so the house behind us is the animal house. 
25 years of male students in great numbers, many more than the three allowed by city um, in that home. Um, there were times when I would threaten if everybody would just go home over summer break that it could burn down, it would be okay with me, and then I thought I'd better stop saying that, or one day the electrics would catch fire and they'd be knocking at my door arresting me for arson. Um, but that house just swayed as well. I probably shouldn't have said that publicly, right? <laughs> that house just swayed. It's been renovated extensively. It's been, uh, had a lot of work indoor and out, and I met the four women who are renting it and uh, invited them over for a barbecue. Um, I'm really hopeful that our neighborhood, which is West Williamsburg Heights, now has a chance to actually attract more people and the benefit of living there is actually, I was hoping, would actually elevate itself and we would attract even more people and that that could actually spill over in the area that we covet, which is close walking distance to a lot that the city has to offer and being able to walk across the grounds at the college and go to Ace Hardware on a Sunday morning, all of those things other people would see and would, would want to be a part of. When the hospitality house was converted to a dormitory space, I was really edgy because I remember when Peter Chang was a bar and the traffic back and forth, both vehicular and pedestrian, was overwhelming and it really had a negative impact on our lives as residents there. Um, the worst was the pair of very, very inebriated kids who kept banging on the door asking to use the bathroom at about 2.30 in the morning when the bars let out. When that became a restaurant and then another restaurant, some of that pressure was reduced and it made sitting outside on a summer evening more pleasant again. Uh, so when the hospitality house converted, I got worried that we were gonna get another wave of very difficult relationships with college kids. And uh, you know, I was one. Uh, I'm sure most people here were at one point a college resident in a town or a city where they may not have been completely welcomed by their neighbors. Um, it's a difficult balance, and I, and I, I admit that. Adding this other dormitory on the other end squeezes the 3% of us that live in this area and squeezes us to where it feels like a strangle. I'm I'm trying not to think about having to sell my home of 25 years because it will be untenable to live in it any longer. I have to think about whether this is a Friday night, a Saturday night, a Sunday morning when the plastic, the sea of plastic cups is deep. I have to think about whether it's going to be a college event where there's going to be a lot of alcohol on what I do on my property, in my home, in my neighborhood. And I shouldn't have to do that. When I moved in, the hospitality house was a thriving hotel. And there were some parts on Richmond Road that were getting a little disheveled. And yes, those have been elevated, as I said. But when I moved into my home, the Days Inn was a motel hotel. And transient or not, those people were here to appreciate the area. They weren't here to drink and party, and they weren't here to ignore those of us that live here. If you have these two dorms coming out like tentacles, and I know that's a negative image, but that's how I've been seeing this, you're squeezing me. You're squeezing me to a point where I may have to go live somewhere else, and that would be a shame because I've really invested, as has my family, into being Williamsburg residents. I thought I was going to retire here, but I'm not going to retire here if I can't sit on my front step on a summer eve and I can't enjoy my backyard because of the noise and the trash and the drinking and the car squealing and the, and the disregard for those of us who live there. So the 3% can go to 2% can go to 1%. I'm sure my house could be a rental. I, w I would hate to see that happen. The only other comment is, I, I mean this kind of in a jokey fashion, but not really. Um, that is 102 rooms if you apply the rules of city residents to that, then you can have a three unrelated adults per room, that's 306, and then you can actually add a fourth because that's what typically happens and nobody has to actually approve that officially. So we can cram 400 kids into that room, that should be good for the college. Thanks. Thank you. 
All right, that's the end of the yellow cards that I have received. Um, this would be a time if, if others wanted to speak to, um, even if you haven't submitted a card, that'd be just fine. Just please come up and tell us your name and your address. Um, we can continue the public hearing. Hi, this is Victor, 704 Powell. Really don't have any uh, anything to add of what we've heard other than just had a couple of questions. Today's article, it mentioned they were buying the property. Now, uh, then it was another part that they were leasing. Is this a lease or a buy? Are they buying it? I'm concerned about the rezoning. What can go there or what would be allowed to go there when it's rezoned? And I don't... Uh, Sorry, could you clarify your, your question, if you would? The rezoning, when yes. they rezone this into another, what would be allowed to be on that property once it's rezoned and William and Mary didn't use that property any longer? Well, all the things that are currently allowed in that... I, I know, I understand, but I'm not familiar with that. I'm just questioning that, you know, what could go there. That's all I'm saying. Uh, should we throw that to staff? No. But anyway, uh, I, I'm Thank concerned you. about the rush okay. um, of why this is coming up all in a week. We go here, 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 all in a week or two weeks, when I would imagine this has been in the minds or been in plan for quite a while. And I understood when it was talked about the years involved were more to the 10 to 12 and not the 5 to 8 or whatever. I understood 12 was mentioned in that. So that's, they're the things that I've just wanted to uh, clarify. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Bob Fall. I also live on Richmond Road, and I'm probably the newest resident of Williamsburg in here. Um, I, for one, am opposed to, to this effort. And uh, what I, among other things, one of the things I have not heard is how has this been handled in the past? I'm sure over the course of the university's uh, existence, this, is not, this has happened before where dormitories needed to be renovated. And I guess what I haven't heard is how, the, how that was done in the past and, and how it was handled then. Why isn't it good enough now? So, I, again, like my neighbors, I question the wisdom of, of going this route. And I don't know what the other alternatives are. Uh, the other thing I would like to address uh, is the, um, the whole issue of, from a student's perspective and uh, I've laid out my opinion at length in, the, in the, the today's Gazette, so I'm not going to dwell on all that. But from a student's opinion, having spent a lot of time in, in motels like this place for uh, the last 40-some years, it's not a conducive place for long stays. You know the construction of the place is steel and concrete. Sorry, uh, Mr. Fowler, if you can uh, just address the mic. I'm they sorry. can hear you through the I'm speakers, sorry. and that way it also gets recorded. All right. Thank you. Uh, the very nature of, the, of this existing facility is, is constructed of steel and concrete. If you spent any time in there, you know that any sounds created upstairs or downstairs to include voices are transmitted. Uh, the fact that cars literally pull up just outside where your head, you lay your head on your pillow at night is somewhat disconcerting. Okay, and I don't see this changing when this becomes... Excuse me, when this becomes a dormitory. The fact that all the doors open to the outside. When I was in federal, I'm still in federal service, but uh, when I was doing a lot more traveling, the Department of Defense would advocate, would suggest to you, never get a first floor room in a place like this because of security issues. Always get a second floor or above. Um, I just don't see the security aspect uh, working out for the benefit of the students. I don't see this working out for a student that's going to be in this place for nine months, trying to sleep regardless of his or hers hours, 
but realizing that there's cars pulling up, motorcycles, whatever, hooting and hollering going outside your room, and there's nothing, literally, no insulation, no sound deadening above you or next to you or to the sides of you that's going to compensate for this. So having spent a lot of time in a place like this, I just cannot see uh, students paying good money to go to university here, having to contend with uh, this kind of facility. So, um, having said that, uh, I support a lot of the other comments uh, that were just made, and uh, that's my two cents worth. Thank you. Thank you. Afternoon. David Crambuel, 201 Harrison Avenue. I live in the zero, call it ground zero, I guess is the term they've used. First, I'd like to just make a few comments, and then I'll move to my general feeling about what should happen. So, and Carolyn, I hope my most respected person in the city, that, and we've got some great people there. Uh, I, I think a couple points might be clarified that... Uh, I think our vice president could clarify. I think I think uh, I, I would hope that the students wouldn't have to move their cars out for the football games that they stay there. So I assume because that's going to create a whole lot of traffic. We already got traffic at football games. Minor point. Uh, a second thing I want to point out that's been alluded to, but has gotten lost with previous people who've negotiated things with the city. When the college takes over a commercial building, we lose a huge amount. The, the people who stayed in the hospitality house, uh, those, I guess you probably know it, but anyway, we lost 90000 in real estate but taxes, but the college is paying us, I think, 120000 I forget the exact number, but it's more than the real estate taxes each year. I don't know whether it's inflation adjusted, but at, but at any rate, the point is that my estimate, having talked to our, our our people who deal with taxes, the meal tax, the room tax, and all of the traffic that feeds our downtown businesses is entirely lost. And this is huge, significant, way beyond what however many students buy in pizzas and, and things like that. And that's not accounted for. And so our whole downtown is impacted enormously by the hospitality house. Well, it's a done deal. And it was done just about like Trump talking to Mexico. I mean, it was just taken over as far as any of us know. There wasn't really advanced discussion or anything. Okay, that's a negative point. Uh, a second point is, um, yes, students walking through the neighborhoods has a huge impact on your living style, as you just heard from the wife of my former doctor, uh, who I love, both of them. And, and it's a huge impact on the neighborhood. And it's particularly a huge impact between the hours of about 10, when everybody walks the bars, and 1.30 or 2 when they come back from the bars. So, so that, that, that's, that's a huge impact, and particularly when they're walking through the neighborhoods. The impact, if you were to deny this on ground zero, is nothing like what's being made here. We already have students there. We're far more attractive than this place, as we already know, is not a very safe, particularly in classic terms, and not a very nice place to live. They're going to want to live in our neighborhoods to the extent there's places you can rent. And of course, I also, with my good friend neighbor, bought a house and totally renovated it. And we rent it out to students and faculty. And of course, we control it to two, even though we could have three. And everything's fine. But if you close this down, and there's 180 students that have to go find places, the neighborhood's already booked. We have four rental units, and every one of them was rented before Christmas for next year. So it ain't going to have any impact on the neighborhood. That's bogus. And there are people who've invested in all kinds of places where students can live that are a whole lot more attractive than, than this, this situation. So that's bogus. And it is true to me, that seems a little odd, unless other people have heard it. I have heard no discussion of the alternatives they could have had 
or to have had in the past, like as was pointed out, renting the dorm that Colonial Williamsburg owns just across the railroad. Of course, it's further away, I understand. This is much more attractive from a distance point of view. But it isn't like there aren't other alternatives, and I would like to hope I'm not involved in it, but I'd like to hope that somebody actually explained to you what the other alternatives were and why they were unacceptable. Because there are other alternatives, and the impact on the neighborhoods is zero, except for the fact that you're going to put a lot of students in this place and they're going to be walking through the neighborhood. But there aren't, and so, so that's that. Okay. So I, I also heard another thing where I'm, I don't have a problem with it the police. We don't need 24-hour police. I agree. Let's put our money where it's important. So item four, I think what you really need is police on the weekends, and you need them during the hours when people, pardon me, get intoxicated. And you have the one or two or three or four percent of the most beautiful student body you can have in the United States, where the, or one of the most beautiful students who suddenly makes a mistake and drinks a little too much. Well, we had a Board of Visitor person drink a little too much. So, I mean, it happens to everybody. So, so we need the police protection for the students and for the neighborhood, uh, I would say, during about 18 hours over, beginning perhaps around 3 or 4 or 2 on Friday until about 2 in the morning, and, and maybe the same on Saturday, 2 or 3 in the afternoon, till 3 in the morning, and the same on Sunday. And, and, and there needs to be, on the week, weekdays, particularly on Thursdays, because some students seem to work a four-day week, that on Thursday nights we, we have parties too. So let's just put the police, I think we could cut it down to half, half the 7 times 24 easily. And, and so I, let's, let's not push something that's not a critical. Okay, and now on item one, or point one, the, the, the term. We, without question, absolutely have to have a terminal point here because this is not a place for a dorm. Absolutely. There's all kinds of other choices. And all of us now turning positive can support that, okay, all the points I made, we are where we are. So, and we need to have a reasonable opportunity for a loan. So I don't know whether you can get a five-year loan or not, or whether you have to pay a higher interest rate. I think we have to move to a concept of trust, mutual trust. Believe me, this has not existed in the past. I've been here since 1970. I spent 20 years in the administration working very closely with President Graves. I was in almost all the meetings. I was in the meetings with two other people, Yankovic and Edwards, when we actually created uh, uh, the vice president's position. And, and so I have a feeling for what has happened. The president, after Graves, got in a fight with Colonial Williamsburg. They were on non-speaking terms, and we were supposed to get one of the houses used for college services. The whole thing was torpedoed, and that president left in a sort of a cloud. The previous president, uh, Taylor, had some financial proposals which never were carried out, and they actually got embroiled in some other issues which you're familiar with. Uh, Mr. Cranville, sorry, I just, um, we have still a few more people that want to speak, uh, I think. All right, okay. Um, and we still have a decision to make, so I wonder if you could um, get to the point. it up. Thank you. Okay, all right. My point is, relax a little bit on the, on the, uh, on the uh, police hours and have it be done in the hours when students are at the party and drink, which is up till about 3 in the morning. I think there should be something where the city picks up trash. In other words, we have one trash vehicle in front of the hospitality house. I don't know why the city should be emptying it. I think the college should, and they should be picking up the cups and whatever that go up and down the street to that dorm. I don't know why the city should have to do it or, or why they should be left there. Okay, a third point is the main point. We have, over the last 
months from what everything I hear and see and people I've talked to created what was said at the beginning by Joe Hertzler, a team effort that has not existed before, which is why the history is important. We're going to have a new president within 24 months or so. We don't know what that person's going to be like. All the people who've worked, including there's at the college, are not perfect. And some of them are very difficult to work with, as I pointed out, and some create all kinds of problems. What we need to do is solidify the current relationship between Sam Jones and the city manager, Marvin. We need to get that solidified in writing with a copy to the Board of Visitors that Sam representing both the endowment board and the college is willing and will work and meet periodically, obviously mostly in confidential, with city management, i.e., and and work together to create what Joe Hertzler said in his first comments in a win-win situation. And that needs to happen. So we, and that needs to have copy to the Board of Visitors so that when we get new people in here, we don't get people like the person that Sam had to, has now replaced in terms of his responsibility. So had a, a rather poor relationship with the city and the residents. We need to keep this codified so that we work on a win-win situation. With respect to whether we have five years or seven years or ten years, I'm not so worried about that. But ten seems like a max. We need to, because in that time frame, we need to be working in trust. We need to trust each other. And so the goal is to not have that be a dorm, but to mitigate the current problem and then work through solutions and presumably develop it into a, a income producing property and, a, and, a, and a, a place that enhances what the college needs are for faculty uh, uh, visitors and for, for incoming parents and for people on football weekends and, and for conferences and all this and that. Uh, we need a place like that and, and then everybody benefits. So thank you. Thank you. Now, I think there may be at least a couple more people that want to speak. Uh, I've been letting people speak because this is obviously an important um, issue, and I, I want to make sure that people take whatever time they need to get things off their chest. But I am going to start holding people to five minutes. Uh, so if, if we have a few more people to speak, please come up. But I am going to let you know when your five minutes is up so that we can get to a decision today. Thank you. I'll be brief. Thank you. <laughs> Bill Talley, 709 College Terrace. Um, I spent a couple of years on the Neighborhood Relations Committee, so I can dovetail what was said tonight as far as concerns from the neighbors. Uh, yes, I appreciate the colleges uh, talking about the code of conduct. The code of conduct doesn't really do much for us with drunk students walking down the street in the middle of the night, so that problem is not going to go away. But a couple of things I wanted to just briefly touch upon are the alternatives. You know, yes, we need to have a win-win situation, all right? I am in favor of, I'm opposed to this conversion, but I am in favor of a sunset clause if it is approved. Why? Because it's going to create the drive to have the college and the city sit down and come up with some alternatives. I heard the college speaking about conversion of the Diller complex to uh, recreational fields, all right? That opens up some property on the college to look at future building because you could utilize some of the existing fields that are there. The other things is since I've been here in the 12 years that I've lived on that street, uh, one third of William and Mary Hall parking lot has been covered with construction equipment. Are there alternatives there? Most certainly. Uh, Henry Coleman brought up some alternatives about the governor's inn, yes, okay? There are all the alternatives. The other alternative is the hospitality house. You know, the city spent over a million dollars for a piece of fire apparatus to reach upper floors. And it's cheaper to go up than out. Uh, one of the things the college talked about at one of our meetings is having to dem uh, demolish a section of the hospitality house and rebuild it. Well, one of the viable options is to go up. Because they're, according to what I'm hearing from city planning, it, state property doesn't have the same restrictions for height that the city does, and they can go up. 
So I am in favor of a sunset clause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ken White. I live at 112 Matoka. I bought my house 25 years ago. Uh, it's been a sizable investment. I love my home. I love the city. Um, and if you'd seen pictures of the home 25 years ago, saw it now, you wouldn't think it was the same place. Um, I moved to the city because I love the city of Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and the College of William Mary. It's a wonderful institution, those two together. Combined, make this a wonderful city to live in. Uh, however, um, I feel the impact greatly because I'm almost right on the corner of Richmond Road, the intrusions, and I'm having to deal with it all the time. Uh, I, I can understand in the compound itself where they propose this dormitory, they'll probably have very good control. Outside of those confines, there won't be much control. I feel the impact already of people parking. I know we have parking by permit, but the only people who are enforcing this are the people like me who go out there and tell people they have to move unless they have a permit to park there, which is usually they do not have one. So it's a real issue. Uh, we have to deal with the noise, the parking, and the people. I'm not bashing students. You know, they're, they're kids. They're growing. They have experiences. but. Uh, I just don't think the college and all the wonderful things they do, and they've done a wonderful job with our campus in developing. I just think this particular development just does not make any sense, and it just does not fit for the city and the residents that live here. Thanks. Thank you. given us an opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Ron Thompson. I, I didn't submit a card. I, I didn't anticipate speaking. I live at 213 Matoka Court. Um, I, I own my own home. I've been there about 16 years. I absolutely love the city. I love Matoka uh, and my neighbors, both students and uh, homeowners. Um, I will share with you that uh, the one argument I've heard from the city and also from the college is that you know, it's almost like a, a threat if if uh, if if we don't get this dormitory for 100 up to 180 students then all those 180 students or the 225 are going to have to be put out in the communities and I have to say I'm fine with that I'm fine with them having to find other other places to live because they'll be in communities that it'll it'll actually not hurt any of our area and it won't hurt other parts of Williamsburg uh, actually, it'll be good for the students and good for the people who are their neighbors to get to know them. Uh, I, I just don't get the argument at all. Whereas if you visit the Days Inn, which I, I live just two blocks away, and you walk around it or if you drive around it, you find, you know, when you look up here at the screen, it looks like a beautiful little area. It's not a beautiful little area. It's just a meager strip of asphalt and with with rooms that are facing the outside and, and patio areas, and it's... It's obviously not intended for 180 young adults that are going to be switching over every year. Um, my issue with, with this whole project, uh, being on Matoka, in which we're, we're just right around the corner, is that we've had major problems on our street with vandalism, with nightly parties. And there's still nightly parties. Last night when I come, there were parties going on. The street was full of, of cars. But we're dealing with that. Our, our street is turning around. We have new families on the street with children, and it's wonderful. And uh, families are starting to invest in the homes when they're turning over. They're not being turned over to landlords. People are investing in them. But, but our li real literal problem is parking and parties. And um, I really feel that having another intense environment of 180 students who Obviously, uh, they're not going to be wanting to stay at the Days Inn 24-7 uh, because there's no place to party, there's no place to go. It's, it's, it's really just an old hotel. They're going to come to Matoka at night because that's where the other students live who have homes where they can, they can accommodate them for parties, etc. You know, the city already changed the, the three-person rule to a four-person rule to accommodate students, and, I, and good for them and good for the college. But... But to add another facility of 180 students off campus, when you walk from that, if, if students who are leaving Days Inn, what's current, currently the Days Inn, to go to campus, they're going to have to go down Brook Street or Matoka 
There's no sidewalk on Brook Street. There's, they're going to be out in the street, foot traffic all day, all night long. And Matoka, our problem is there's not, there's not really a good parking uh, area solution there for, for days in. There's no parking on Richmond Road. And so where are their friends and family going to park? If they have restricted parking there, where are they going to park? They're going to go to Matoka Court. And we already have issues. Even though we, we're in a red, red decal zone, when you come there at night, there's all kinds of cars without decals spending the night because their friends spend the night at the houses, etc. So when you talk about 180 students, it's their friends also that come to visit. And I, I, I'm just, I just think it's going to be devastating because our street used to be, and I, I say this often, I, I know Patoka people don't like to hear it probably, but it used to be like Dodge City. If you woke up in the mornings, beer bottles broken all along the street, trash cans, uh, I mean... Um, beer cans in everybody's yard, uh, litter galore, and, and the aftermath of party sofas out on the lawns. It was really rough. But thankfully, Chief Slogi and the, the uh, enforcement people the, uh, with the city really helped us out and got it straightened out. But now with, uh, with this change, I really believe that our, our neighbor is going to suffer. And it, and it will be what the students want it to be, which is an all-student street. And then, uh, then it's going to be really difficult for the city, and, and we'll never recover. So thank you for listening to my argument. Thank you. I think everybody in this room has spoken. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not everyone. All right. <laughs> My name is Bill Dell. I live at 245 evening. North Henry. It's been a long time since I've been up here and talked to the uh, Planning Commission or the Council for that matter. Uh, I'd like to say, first of all, that I'm going to be short. I do support Bob Fall's well thought out article in the Virginia Gazette this morning. I think most of you have certainly seen it. Uh, if, if you haven't, you will. Uh, but I have to say, I think that this proposal is ill advised for all of the reasons. Uh, that have been stated this afternoon, and I won't go into additional ones. And I have to say that I agree with David Cranbuehl about the argument of limiting students in single-family residences in town is largely bogus because they're already full, and you're not going to find any more or very few, certainly not enough for 180-plus students coming out there. I like Joe Hertzler's proposal of a win-win. And... The reason I'm saying this, it's a very simple win-win, but it's something that could be done if we want it bad enough. And that is, number one, for the college to realize, of course they do realize, that dorms are revenue positive. So why didn't the college, on the acres of land that they have, go ahead and build new dormitories that's going to fix the problem? Number two, the city should buy the motel, tear it down, and build housing, inner city housing, for the hundreds of people that, number one, need it and are looking forward to ultimately moving in to the city. That way the city is going to have, it's going to be revenue positive for the city and they're not going to lose the revenue that's going to, that would have been uh, coming in from the motel. And as sure as I'm standing here, if the Real Estate Foundation is successful in buying that property, Ultimately, it's going to be transferred to the state, and the city will lose all control over whatever goes on there. You know, everybody in this room knows that. So that's my two cents worth, and I just wanted to uh, give that suggestion as a win-win uh, that will work for both the city and the college. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Terrence Wheel, uh, 412 Harriet Tubman Drive. Um, I think if we looked at the comprehensive plan and we took ourselves six months back, we would never imagine that a student dormitory would be an allowed use where it's being proposed. So I think on precedent, we can certainly examine that plan a little more closely and see what the intentions were. And in a, in a larger scale, I think we need to address where do we want student housing to go now and uh, clearly delineate it for the future, because this is sort of a you know come by come event. But I did think I heard the attorney mention that if this is not approved, the 
that there was a threat of eminent domain or that that was a possibility. And in that case, I guess we should just get that on the table because if that is, if that is in the background, then maybe we need to work together now today. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the audience? Mercifully hearing none, um, I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, who wants to begin? He's the one. Get through this thicket. I have some thoughts. I've been scribbling madly, if, if you guys okay. would like me to start out. Certainly, go ahead. Um, I'm trying to figure out where we have consensus. Um, and I think there are a few points where we have something close to consensus. The trouble is some of them are in favor of the project and some of them are against the project. Uh, I think there is agreement that we need to reduce the oversupply of hotel rooms in the city. Uh, I, I, there wasn't a lot of comments about that because that's, that's not what the concerns are, the primary concerns are of um, the, the neighborhood. I think we have something close to consensus on the need to, um, on wanting to minimize the need for off-campus housing. That's in the college's interest and that's in the city's interest. That is, in fact, written into the comprehensive plan. Um, third, um, we, or the college, has a need. I don't think anybody disputes this, although there are some comments at the end about whether this is the, the best way or, or the only way to achieve this, but the college has a need to renovate its existing stock of housing. Uh, some of these buildings are 75, 80, 90 years old, uh, and that's a, reasonable, uh, that's a reasonable need. So I don't think there's a lot of a disagreement. I didn't hear anybody disagreeing with any of those points. I don't think well, I'd like to hear if either of you disagree with any of those points. Uh, but unfortunately, we also have some agreement on um, some other points that, that really are, um, that, that speak uh, or that, that maybe urge um, something other than approving this project. To start with, and this was really, this came out, this became much more clear to me in the, the emails that we received, um, the comments that we received by email rather than in the, the, the public hearing, uh, but this would, be, this would be a very high density parcel. It's one and a half, 1.6 acres, and we're talking about 180 students, and that far exceeds what we currently allow uh, any, any, any other part of the city um, using 14 units per acre as a sort of benchmark is what we allow with the special use permit and using three uh, people per unit, four maybe being charitable, gets us into a range of about 80 to 100 people that would be permissible by a special use permit somewhere else in the city. And if we use the eight number, it cuts that down significantly to about 60 people. So. Whether that's a, whether that's a, I don't think we have to um, hold ourselves to that, but as a benchmark, as a way of comparing just how intense this use is, I think this is clearly a very, very intense use. And it doesn't matter if you're putting 180 Amish kids in there or 180 college students, this is an intensive use. So I, again, I didn't hear any disagreement about the intensity of the use. Um, second was, this is, um, there is clearly a need to house these students someplace. And what, what we are doing, what we would be doing in allowing this would be to ask uh, one neighborhood or one district in the city to, to bear the burden of that. And I think someone at the end, I've forgotten who it was now, but somebody raised the point that uh, they had no objection whatsoever to distributing that burden throughout the city. Um, and uh, that, is, that is clearly a choice, right? We, we gotta have, we've gotta find a place to house 225 students. So the question is, do you, do you distribute that throughout the city, which it may or may not be able to absorb. I don't think, I don't really have a clear sense of that. I heard some implications that maybe it's not capable of, of absorbing that. Or do we, do we ask this one part of town to, to shoulder that burden? Um, third. We do, there is again consensus on this. We, this does take an important piece of commercial property off the tax rolls. I, I, I didn't hear that being a primary concern of a lot of people, but that's clearly, that's clearly an issue. I think for my money, that's a sort of minor piece of the puzzle. I, I tend to focus on the density more than um, removing this money from the tax rolls. But that is, that is something, and that's clear. Um, and then the, the last thing, and this is sort of related to the density question for me is, um, 
it might well be that high density is, uh, or density of this kind is appropriate on campus and adjoining campus, but this is, as we all can see by looking at the map, this is in fact a sort of island surrounded by, surrounded by neighborhoods and um, obviously that's why we're having, that's why we've had an hour and a half of comments. Um, and that too is inarguable, that's just a fact of what's on the ground and, and we can't take that parcel and shift it closer to campus. So I'd like to hear from the other commissioners who can participate in this discussion whether I've kind of missed the boat on this and then also yeah, begin a conversation about how we can move forward. I'd like to find a way, I'd like to find a way for us to help solve this problem. Uh, it's hard for me to see right now how we can, um, given everything I've just said, or at least given my understanding of the problem, how this proposal um, is an equitable, maybe is the way to put it, way to solve this problem. I think your comments are astute as usual. Um, something that was also brought up is the uh, suitability of the structure itself to be a dormitory. Uh, as far as safety is concerned, its age. Um, I had the opportunity to work there when I was a student here 50 years ago at, at this, uh, in this building, and um, I know it a little bit. I don't think it's improved a lot since. Um, and it's not a, not a situation that existed when there was a fire and we students were housed at the former Motel 8 on a temporary basis. This is, you're asking for permanency here. And um, I think the urgency of the request kind of bothers me a little bit and that it suggests a certain lack of administrative planning on the part of the college. But I don't know the ins and outs of that. Um, there are compelling reasons, I think, not to recommend changes to the zoning ordinance and uh, issuance of a special use permit. Um, first, we've heard from many residents who oppose that and brought up the reasons for that. Secondly, the long-term economic plans for the Midtown area, and this is in the Midtown, uh, city's Midtown area, are currently pretty much in flux. Um, the Days Inn is in the fledgling arts and cultural district. The fate of the Williamsburg Shopping Center is not entirely clear nor are the plans for the former Motel 8 site. The city owns a property adjacent to the Days Inn, and the character of its development really hinges uh, greatly on the Midtown planning and the changing economic atmosphere. Um, all the mixed use, including student housing, is advocated in the 2013 Comprehensive Plan, as noted by s staff in the memo. Um, I think the plan envisions new and appropriately repurposed uh, mixed-use development rather than patching up uh, uh, an aging motel. Uh, such rezoning may be suitable if the college can cooperate on meeting both the housing needs of the university and the economic needs of the city in a, in a new suitable venue. Thirdly, the city, as Mr. Clee mentioned, uh, uh, will lose sales and property tax with the sale of this. Um, I think those are the, the main concerns that, that I have, that, and the fact that there doesn't seem to be any other alternatives to this situation uh, presented by the college. So those, to add to that. Thank you. You know, we, we keep mentioning the, the lost income and tax from, from this project coming in and taking away from the commercial viability of the property, but the truth of the matter there is if it's not now, it's going to happen anyway. That hotel is not going to continue as is. <laughs> We're going to lose that commercial money anyway, probably sooner rather than later, uh, and then what becomes of it? Uh, because I'm, I'm sure it's been on the market quite a long time, and this is the first thing that has that has come along. Now we all looked at the, I guess it was the Best Western on the corner, just about across the street from it, uh, corner up there, and that sat for an awful lot of years and continued to get worse and worse and worse. Uh, and I, I can't help but feel that that's probably where this piece of property is headed as well. Um, 
ideally is it the best solution I, I don't know that it is um, I don't know that it isn't I don't know what a better solution is right now um, I, I know that um, it will be a huge investment I'm guessing um, the appearance of the property obviously from looking at the pictures is much much better than what we're looking at right now which is arguably the entryway to Colonial Williamsburg um, that's not a I guess it's an eyesore for lack of better term but it's it's not much to look at there um, and lastly when I talk about Colonial Williamsburg as well to me the two biggest economic drivers of this city are Colonial Williamsburg and the College of William and Mary and obviously um, from my perspective uh, the more successful those two are the more successful the city is um, and I agree with a lot of what I've heard that we need to find a way to work together uh, with the city and William and Mary to to fix this problem um, unless I'm in complete misunderstanding it's not a permanent solution it's a temporary solution uh, but what we will get out of a temporary solution is a much better looking piece of property um, and structure than we have right now um, and with with the sunset um, provision in there does not work out we'll be back here having this conversation again on the other hand if it does uh, we're gonna be back here anyway with the sunset provision but I I think the mechanism is there with that provision that if it's not a successful project that we can go back and revisit it and do something about it at, at that time um, but I, I don't think in the next five years anything positive more positive than this anyway is going to happen with that particular parcel I think the sunset clause is is key to the project well let's just talk about that for a minute so we have we have a staff recommendation uh, for approval with a number of conditions and um, we've had some discussion about the security guard and whether that was a um, uh, something that was absolutely necessary but then the key one was this uh, five-year the five-year um, sunset um, we did hear some discussion about some other numbers we heard eight to ten as the the length of time but this um, site is anticipated to be needed as an overflow dorm um, I, I I heard a number of applicants concern uh, or worried I think reasonably about well eight to ten years is a long time even five years is a long time if you're thinking about either a just living there or be trying to sell a property that you've invested uh, a lot of money in and um, uh, worrying that that sale is not going to be um, well that you would lose some some market value in your in your property with this at the end of the street um, so I think before we even get to the sunset discussion and whether whether we uh, do five or ten years I think we have to get some kind of a feeling about whether whether this this project is something that we can really support as it's as it's in front of us and I think I hear less support over here and more support over there I don't think I can support this with 180 students in there um, I, I really think that's that's really going to be disruptive for this neighborhood whether it's two years or five years or ten years or a longer period of time uh, I, I, I'd be I'd be more comfortable with it if we got closer to one of our one of our kind of benchmarks whether that's 14 units per acre or eight units per acre and I just was trying to do some math here a second ago I mean that really reduces unfortunately the the, the probably the viability of this it really reduces how many uh, students we could put in this location and again increases uh, their distribution throughout the city uh, if we use 15 units per acre you're talking about 65 to 70 students if we use eight units per acre you're talking about about 40 students not many I mean it's whatever that is 20 percent of the total that needs to be rehoused um, and just using that I mean I, I it's hard for me to imagine that this is worth doing for three million dollars if you're only going to put 70 students in there so it's almost I guess what I'm doing is saying I'm the one limitation I could see putting on this is probably a limitation that makes it not work um, 
with that said, I, I would like to find a way forward that helps to solve this problem. Um, do any of us have any questions before we, 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 can, we have an opportunity here to ask questions of both the applicant and staff if there are follow-up questions that we need to ask? But have we heard anything from the audience that prompted any additional uh, feedback? We have enough information to make a decision. So we heard from Mr. Getty that five years, a five-year sunset is really a, a non-starter for, for, um, for the applicant. Uh, is, that, is that an accurate representation? Is that still true? Yes, okay. Um, I'm not comfortable with a five-year, I mean with more than a five-year sunset again with this, with this many students there. I really would like to see this number uh, reduced. Uh, it's just Again, I don't care how well behaved the students are. There's just there's, there's a hugely, hugely increased intensive use on that site with 180 students out there. Um, with that said, I, I could imagine I could imagine a motion that would that would approve this, but with the limitation that is is going to make it unviable. And uh, I'm not sure if that's the smart thing for us to do. But I would entertain a motion from from another commissioner that. Um, be Solomonic, more <laughs> Solomonic than I can be right now. Well, I will, I'm, I'm content to make a motion and we can see how it goes. If it doesn't pass, we need to continue until we have a motion that passes. <laughs> um, Well, let's let's try this. I want to make sure I get all the uh, the conditions right. Do we do 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 the two of you agree with the conditions that, as written in uh, the staff recommendations, uh, leaving out the gate enclosure and um, the six foot fence? In other words, conditions. Well, I guess it was just condition condition two that was that was um, eliminated in uh, last night's meeting. Is that right? All right. Okay. Do either of you have any objections to the other conditions as they're written? Well, we should talk about four also, the on-site security guard. We heard that that would be cost prohibitive, and we also heard a suggestion from uh, Mr. Cranebuehl that uh, that might be excessive, uh, or at least not, strictly speaking, not, not necessary. Any thoughts on the security guard, on what we can do with that condition? I can't be the only one working up here. Well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm thinking that can be rewritten as needed and, and let that, uh, you know, obviously one of the neighbors that spoke with us, he had an idea what the hours were, and I'm mm -hmm. sure that they could probably work that out with the college. So I, I think you could probably approach that as needed. Or yeah. at least during the, probably not needed during the daylight hours, mm -hmm. but maybe during the evenings. All right. Um, how do we suggest rewording that then? An on-site security guard being in position on the property between what hours? Sunset and sunrise. <laughs> let's 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 name some hours. <laughs> well, it's hard to do when uh, you know the sun rises at different times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we have to put some hours Probably on that. Probably do. Okay. Six to six. Six to six. That's 12 hours a day. I, I think that's still going to be difficult. Yeah. Um, Mr. Julian, are you comfortable with that? If we include that as a condition? I think we are <laughs> rearranging the deck, the chairs on the deck at the moment, but yeah, that's fine. I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Yes. Sorry, Mr. Getty, yes. Um, you're not quite there yet, but if, if you do get to the discussion of the sunset, mm -hmm. um, I've been advised the college could agree to a 10-year 
Okay. It's that provision. Thank you. That helps. Thank you. All right. So uh, we, we have 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. for the security guard. Um, I, I heard a, a reasonable suggestion that that only be from Thursday to Sunday. Uh, is that something that we're comfortable with? We don't need an evening security guard on Tuesday. Uh, it's for the protection of the students rather than keep them from partying. Okay. So I don't think that Tuesday is any less dangerous than Thursday. Okay. I think that's a that's a fair point. Okay. Um, bike racks were non-controversial. Parking, we've we've I think we've resolved. Um, there were still some questions about parking. I. I um, <laughs> the, the condition that I intend to uh, add would eliminate the parking problem. Mm -hmm. um, all right. And do we change number one to 10 years? I'm comfortable with this as a 10-year approval. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I agree. Okay. Uh, well, I, what I'd like to do then um, is add a condition eight and that condition eight is that um, condition eight already. Oh, for heaven's sakes! Thank you. Uh, and the, yeah, the minor site plan. Okay, uh, it'll be a condition nine. Um, and I want to see if we have agreement on this. And if we don't, that's fine. I'll make the motion, and it'll and it'll fail. Um, I'd like to add a condition um, that we limit the number of students. Uh, resident students, not including RAs or, or staff or anything else, but resident students. Um, I'm going to say to, to um, 80 students, which is higher than the 14 units per acre would allow, um, and is, but is less than half of what the college has asked for. Um, I think that's still a lot, uh, but I feel like this is a site that at least has a chance of absorbing it. I'm, I'm afraid that's going to make it a not a viable project, but uh, I, I at least want to put that out there as a, an attempt to find a way forward. Um, do either of you have any serious objections to that? And if you do, of course, you can vote no. That's fine. But, um, all right. Is there any other discussion, any other questions for the applicant or for staff? All right. Uh, I'm going to move that we accept, let me make sure I get the two, that we accept these uh, two applications, PCR 17-001 and PCR 17-002, uh, with the conditions uh, recommended by staff, including that, uh, or with the following amendments. The permit shall be valid for a period not to exceed 10 years from the date of approval. Uh, that the proposed six-foot fence should be located at least five feet from the side property. That an on-site security guard uh, is in position on the property for 12 hours a day from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, that this approval is limited to the current building only. That the college provide bike racks at this location. That the college adequately addresses parking needs uh, for this project. Uh, and that a minor site plan is submitted and approved by staff addressing the site plans uh, noted above. And finally, an additional condition um, that we cap the number of students uh, on this site at 80. Mr. Klee, could I get you to revise your motion to recommend to City Council that yes, they approve Reco the yes. project with the following conditions? Thank you. Yes. Uh, Mr. Trivet, would you call the roll, please? Was there a second? Oh, we need a second. Thank you. See, my first time. <laughs> we have a second. Second. Thank you. Mr. Trivet, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Edwards? Aye. Mr. Klee? Aye. Mr. Julian? Nay. Motion passes. Thank you. I will take over now, and we will move on to our second set of public hearings, PCR 17-005 and PCR 17-006. Request of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation to rezone a portion of 400 South Nassau Street from CW Colonial Williamsburg Historic Area to MS Museum Support. And request of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation for a special use permit to construct 34 parking spaces at 400 South Nassau Street in the CW Colonial Williamsburg Historic Area. Uh, 
and I need to recuse myself from this application as an employee <laughs> of Colonial Williamsburg. Ms. Murphy, will you present the staff report? Yes, Ms. Stafford and members of the Planning Commission, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation is proposing to rezone a portion of the property at can 400. I ask, excuse me, can I ask everybody who's clearing the room to do so now while we continue with the rest of the Planning Commission meeting? Thank you. Ms. Murphy, go ahead. Okay. The Colonial Williamsburg Foundation is proposing to rezone a portion of the property at 400 South Nassau Street, as shown on this slide, from Colonial Williamsburg Historic Area, CW, to Museum Support, MS, to accommodate a new entrance pavilion for the Arts Museums at Colonial Williamsburg. The applicant states that a major feature of the museum expansion is to increase the visibility and accessibility of the museum entrance from the historic area. This will be achieved by changing the location of the entrance from the public hospital fronting on Francis Street to a new entrance on Nassau Street. A new en entrance on Nassau Street is proposed that includes an entry pavilion on the museum side and across the street as shown on the enclosed drawing. This slide shows basically the, the rezoning portion in red and the special use permit portion. The other portion across the street is the museum, the existing museum and the museum expansion. The second part of the request is for a special use permit for an expansion of the parking area to construct 34 parking spaces in the CW district. The applicant received conceptual approval from the Architectural Review Board in December. The Site Plan Review Committee reviewed the request and recommended approval at the January meeting. This property is also located in the Archaeological Review District. They performed a Phase I Archaeological Survey, which recommend, recommended no further archaeological review for this project. A copy was included in your packet. This slide shows two renderings, which shows the entry pavilion on one and both sides of the street. And as you can see, uh, you can see one without it and one with it. The location of the proposed entrance pavilion in the CW district is not allowed. The applicant has stated that the entrance pavilion that spans both sides of Nassau Street is needed to increase visibility and accessibility of the museum entrance from the historic area. This has resulted in the applicant requesting a rezoning for only the portion of the property that is needed to accommodate the new pavilion on the edge of the district from Colonial Williamsburg Historic District CW to museum support. This major expansion of the museum will help maintain the commercial and economic development of the downtown area as recommended in Chapter 10 of the Comprehensive Plan. Therefore, staff supports the rezoning request. The second part of the proposal is for a special use permit to extend the, air, the parking area associ associated with the new entrance. They propose to construct 34 parking spaces to offset spaces lost with the pavilion and reconfiguration of the parking lot. Staff has reviewed this request and supports a special use permit being approved because the proposal is in harmony with the comprehensive plan, the zoning district, adjacent properties, and surrounding neighborhoods. Therefore, staff recommends that Planning Commission accept the Phase I archaeological report and recommend the City Council approval of the rezoning request as detailed in Proposed Ordinance 17-03 and the special use permit to extend the parking area by 34 parking spaces. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. CW representatives are also here if you have any questions of them. Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Murphy? No? All right. So I will open the public hearing. Um, would the applicant like to make a statement? Sitting so long. <laughs> <laughs> Vice Chair Stafford, members of the board. Uh, my name is Neil Elwine. I'm with Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. A, a major feature of the uh, museum expansion project was to increase visibility and accessibility of the museum, uh, uh, particularly uh, as a new entrance from the historic area. Since the day that the uh, DeWitt Wallace Museum opened, one of the major criticisms and operational challenges has been the difficulty of identifying the main museum entrance. Uh, one of the main goals of this museum expansion has been to solve this problem by creating a prominent museum entrance that is both respectful to the surrounding environment, yet it's, an obvious, to, it's obvious to the visitors, whether arriving by foot or by bus or by automobile, that it would be uh, clear uh, as to where the entrance to the museum is. 
Since the existing museum is located against the historic area zoning boundary to the north, the best opportunity to minimize zoning impact was to locate the new entrance along Nassau Street. After an extensive design effort by Sam Anderson Architects, uh, the current proposal was developed, which provided the entrance on Nassau Street with a, featuring a central cupola topped pavilion flanked on both sides uh, by the arcades. That uh, original uh, concept that was talked over uh, in, uh, in uh, more detail and it was flushed out in a uh, session with the uh, Board of Trustees, uh, the idea to do a mirror image of the entrance arcade on the opposite side of the street uh, came up and was uh, enthusiastically supported by uh, the Board of Trustees and, and the architect and staff. So it places a mirror image arcade on the east side of Nassau Street. It, it increases it visibility uh, to the site and enhances the arrival experience. It helps to create and extend the focus space outside of the museum, providing a transition from the parking area. Uh, it provides more opportunity for landscaping and benches and seating uh, as an arrival entrance. It helps uh, transition from the parking lot area, if you will, uh, into the museum. It, it, uh, we think that it helps transform essentially the Nassau Street, which was kind of a, a, a you know, sleepy area that didn't get much attention and uh, didn't have much excitement uh, about it. And it, we're trying to create you know, a sense of arrival and, uh, that would celebrate the uh, visitation to the museum. The request was made to uh, minimize the extent of rezoning uh, of historic area space to, uh, to museum support to accommodate the new uh, arcade that was proposed on the east side. Uh, we tried to do that by minimizing the uh, amount of rezoning, so it's just enough to achieve the setbacks for the uh, arcade on the east side of uh, Nassau Street. So we, f we feel that uh, that small amount of rezoning to, rezoning to museum support uh, is, is really non-impactful uh, and uh, has minimum uh, impact on the historic area and would create a buffer to the uh, 18th century John Custis property should that site be decided to be developed in the future. Um, one of the site, man site plan maps showed the John Custis property um, you can see it's kind of in the middle of the uh, what's now a sheep pasture, and uh, so we feel that we still have sufficient buffer between the uh, the arcades that would be constructed on the east side of the street and that property should it be developed in the future. So in summary, we appreciate city planning staff's efforts and the planning commission's consideration of this request. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions of the applicant? Questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. If there's anyone in the audience who'd like to come forward and speak to this proposal, just come forward and state your name and your address. Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing and open it up for discussion by the Planning Commission. Any comments from members of the Planning Commission? I think that, uh, of course, the uh, museum current uh, configuration was in order to actually hide it from the uh, sort of have it blend into the historic area. Of course, the historic area was, was opened up a little bit to include the museum and the, uh, well, to include the uh, public hospital. But having the entrance and the wall and, and all of that was to sort of uh, disguise the, the uh, museum in the begin with and uh, obviously has backfired over the last 30 years and it became one of Colonial Williamsburg's best kept secrets that they actually had a museum. So I, I can see the need to make it more obvious that there is something to see and it's something that you need to see. Uh, the signs that we put up a couple of years ago uh, were helpful but I think this will, will be um, I don't have a problem myself with moving part of the historic area or removing 20,000 square feet of the historic area 
into museum support uh, for the project. I think it's worth it. I think we need to to be mindful of encroaching on what has been a sacred area, and we shouldn't do it with. Parking lot, well screened. I think. I, I agree with you as well, actually. Um, and I think that not only does it uh, positively impact the museum and Colonial Williamsburg, but also potentially the the park that is between the museum and the law school. I think having foot traffic that way could be a positive thing for the park otherwise, but could be a great sort of well used green space. Uh, public too. Yeah, I, I think that um, we knew something was coming for a couple of years now as we've um, known there's going to be this renovation coming along. Um, so I have no quarrel with what is a small measure to make, I think, a better aesthetic across the, the board there. Um, and I, I don't think that there's an answer that we have on this, but just as a comment, I mean, that road currently, especially where the a little bit of sheep pasture, but usually it seems like there's horses in there, um, <laughs> at least from, from my sight lines. Um, that that's a that's a very popular place for buses to s s linger, load, unload, and all that. And obviously, potentially buses coming and unloading people and they go into the museum is a positive thing. But I certainly think we'd want to think a little bit more strategically about that whole streetscape, so that what is potentially this, you know beacon to draw people in is not occluded by, you know, eight buses many hours of the day. Um, but that's a, that's a bigger picture um, thing to think about as we move forward. But in terms of the rezoning and this use, I, I think this is perfectly fine and it's, it's nice looking. I have no issues whatsoever. <laughs> All right. Do I hear a motion? Sure. Uh, yeah, I motion that we uh, approve PCR uh, number 17-005 and PCR number 17-00-6 uh, as recommended by staff. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Trivet, will you call the roll, please? Taller? Aye. Edwards? Aye. Stafford? Aye. Macbeth? Aye. Julian. Hi. All right. Um, then I will now open the open forum. If there's anybody out there would like to come and address the Planning Commission on any issue over which we have purview, please feel forward to please feel free to come forward <laughs> and state your name and address. Seeing no one, I'll close the open forum. We have nothing under site plans and subdivisions. Under unfinished business, the five-year capital improvement program, we need to finalize the memo to send to, uh, to the city manager. Um, so uh, in your packet is the draft letter that um, Carolyn put together. Does anybody have any um, additions or changes to the draft letter? Nice, easy meeting. Mm -hmm. All right. Nice short letter. All right. Sure. So, do we need a motion to send it? Can I can I have a motion to send the letter as written? So moved. Second. <clears throat> Mr. Trivet, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Schaller. Aye. Mr. Edwards. Aye. Mr. Clee. Aye. Ms. Stafford. Aye. Ms. Macbeth. Aye. Mr. Julian. Aye. All right. Is there any new business? Hearing none. Um, there are some information items available um, at the bottom of the agenda. And then we do have one public hearing scheduled for March 15th, PCR 17-004, a request of Pittman Chrysler Corporation for a special use permit to construct a new Williamsburg Kia de dealership at 2800 Richmond Road. All right. Well, now that we've gotten through the agenda, I will call this meeting of the Williamsburg Planning Commission to close.